Cool. Welcome to the last session of today. Uh, I know I'm between you and the reception, so I'll make it short. This is about modernizing APIs using state-of-the-art in infrastructure. My name is Dennis Kieselhorst. I'm a solutions architect at AWS, and I'm also a fan of Java, like in the previous session. And when I started my career 20 years ago, I had to do a lot with APIs. So basically the service-oriented architecture thing came up. I implemented SOAP APIs with Apache Access. And later on, we moved over to Apache CXF. And nowadays, in my day job as a solutions architect at AWS, I still see even 15 years later, those APIs are still around and customers struggle how to modernize the infrastructure that's underlying. And this is what this talk brings together. And actually, we will start with a short intro. I assume you all know what APIs are, but I will introduce CXF as a project. Um, I will also provide a quick intro on what a server is. We'll have a modernization scenario. So I created um, a common thing that I saw anonymized, of course, uh, with a customer. And then we'll have a short look at different ways on how to implement API infrastructure with the API first versus the code first approach. And then I'll get into a demo. I hope I will not mess it up as uh, in the previous session, but it can happen for sure. Uh, we'll look at the life cycle of uh, serverless function. Um, then we do some performance optimizations with uh, Lambda snap start on the one hand and with GraalVM native image on the other hand. And then we are done and you uh, can head out to the reception. So what are APIs? Um, you all know it because this is the API track. Um, so, but just to tell you, although there's a lot of AI stuff around nowadays, you, you need even APIs for that, right? So APIs are important. That's why we are here and we need to take care of building great APIs. Um, the rest of the part I skip here. But Apache CXF is a project within the Apache Software Foundation for 16 years now already. Um, that takes care of implementing APIs in Java. Um, it's called Open Services Framework because you can do a lot more. But APIs, providing APIs, implementing them, that's the main aspect of it uh, in Java. Using JAX WS, which is a specification that deals with uh, SOAP and, and whistles and stuff. And nowadays, which is more common, it's JAX. RS or the new name with a move to Jakarta is Jakarta RESTful uh, Web Services. Um, and uh, specification wise, Whistles is for the old world. You have an XML uh, based file that defines the interface. And nowadays we we uh, providing more uh, the OpenAI API specification or Swagger, how it was called um, previously. Um, but it, as we are looking into a, a very legacy-fashioned API, we will deal with all the XML stuff today. Good. What is serverless and, and why should you consider using it? So what serverless means is there are still servers involved, but you no longer have to deal with it, right? So it's abstracted away. You don't need to take care of the infrastructure provisioning. You don't have to take care of the management. You can just focus on your API code and the business logic. That's um, one cool aspect. The other cool aspect is if you are not sure how much traffic you will get on your API in the end, uh, serverless offers you to automatically scale for you. So there is no need to size it up front and collect uh, how many requests will I be getting. Of course, even, even if you are in the cloud, there are some limitations, quotas somewhere, so you should have an idea, but it's not like you need to have it when you order the hardware and set it up, and if your project fails, you have made all the investments and they are, they are gone when you shut the project down. So you pay for value. If there is no request coming in uh, and your API isn't used at all, you are not paying. If it's uh, used a lot, you are paying more, like um, using ele electricity, for example. And lastly, it's uh, highly available and secure. So the cloud provider has multiple Availability zones, uh, is it called in case of AWS and regions? So that way you can make it available globally and it's, it's much easier to roll it out for you and reach global scale. 
And security is always the top priority for it as well. So you have all the construct and the previous talk was about authorization, things like that. Um, this is uh, available as well. Good, our scenario, I already said, it's the mature API that you have in place, right? So think about no changes happened for a long time. Um, the API is running there, but the underlying infrastructure, it's really a pain for the team maintaining it because security team flagged several times. You need to do updates for it, but you can't just move the old API to something new. Although you, you would like to, there are too many consumers, you would need to contract again with all of them. So very difficult to move away, you, you need to keep that running. Um, and in our case, it's a whistle uh, interface definition that has been shared with all the other parties. And these parties rely on the interface and they don't want to make investments to move away because it just works and um, we want to keep it. So we have the API scenario here again, um, and you want to expose the, the API endpoint as it was before um, without an interface change. So no change to REST, GraphQL, or gRPC, or something new that you'd like to try, and the developers are super keen on moving away. You have to provide this, um, but the underlying infrastructure needs to be modernized. What are we doing? Um, and there are Basically, two ways in general if you provide um, APIs. So I know this slide is a bit overloaded, uh, but you get it in the end so you can compare the two approaches. Uh, in summary, the contract API first approach means you start with the definition, right? So um, in our case, the whistle file, uh, this is the truth, and I generate the uh, code from it. So this is like a contract. I can generate server code, client code um, just from that. Um, the code, this is the disadvantage, everything is inside it. Everything that you find in the interface is also part of the code, even if I'm not interested in it or I'm not even using it. Uh, it will be by standard everything generated, and if there are changes, um, it, it may also result in compile errors, which is cool. If, if I see that something changed, I directly detect it. But if I just use partial things out of the API, that's a disadvantage. I still have everything generated in there. I'm reading the whole thing that is part of the API. Code first, on the other hand, um, is very um, appreciated by the developers, right? Because they can just stick to the language, just writing Java. Uh, and at some point, the open API specification or the whistle file comes out of it, which is nice. And um, if Developers are working closely together. That's the fastest way to interact, right? Just share the interface. This is how, how we did it 15 years ago. Just share the interface um, in a JAR file, and then both can work on the interface, and you don't even need to deal with, uh, with the whistle XML stuff. Uh, it's just happening behind the scenes. Um, but the generated specification, of course, will reflect everything that's inside your code. And if you do a mistake and you expose something that is internal, uh, your consumers will also see that in the interface definition. Our approach was the existing API, there is already a definition, and we want to keep it as is. So we go for API first, and that, that's always the um, option that I would suggest if you deal with external parties or more than one consumer and it goes external, I'd go with the API first approach, but there are a lot of um, resources around these two approaches as well. So API first is what we do. We have the existing whistle file. Now um, let's get to the code and take a look. So what, what are we doing? Here's our whistle file. Just making it a bit larger here. So as said, a lot of this is, this is part of the CXF um, demo um, project. So we have a, a few samples. So overall, uh, pretty simple. We have a customer definition here in the, if for the uh, younger ages, if you have never seen XML. This is how we did it before, JSON and YAML stuff. Um, so quite nice because it's all type, but it's, you see it's a lot of 
boilerplate stuff that's that's in there and we have an operation which is called get customer by name this there are some other things like update customer but we are using get customer by name for now um, and uh, some some other binding soap whatever stuff that's not primarily interesting for us now so and we want to get that running so what we did is we copied the whistle file into a new project um, and Let's look at our Maven POM that we use for, for building. What have I added in there? So obviously we are using CXF. So let me get here. So we, we are using some CXF parts and I think the interesting piece starts here. So there is a code gen plugin that allows you in CXF to generate your code from the whistle file. So that exists from the beginning and that's convenient for us. So what we do is we take the whistle file and generate the code from it. And then I'll get an interface, which is here in my generated sources, which just reflects. And I also get the customer class, like with all the attributes. Um, and I get the interface um, where I have the operation get customer by name. And then I just build a small implementation uh, this is also part of our um, samples uh, in the CXF GitHub, uh, where I have get customer by name, and then there's just a for loop generating some sample data so that we can test it. So what, what I now added to modernize it is I added uh, another framework called Quarkus, which is supported by Red Hat. Uh, is one of the projects that is commonly used for building microservices. There's also Micronaut and Spring uh, Boot that's commonly used, but I use Quarkus for it. Um, I also added this to my POM file, and what you now see when I'm building it is, oops. That is pretty, so it's generating the code. There's, there's one test that's running, um, just checking everything. Then it builds the file, um, and I'm done in eight seconds. And now I deploy it um, using a CLI tool. So I will deploy it to AWS because it's my employer. You could also um, deploy it to a different cloud provider with similar function. We use AWS. And I use, um, as a tool for deployment to set up the whole infrastructure, I use the serverless um, uh, application um, model, so SAM. It has a CLI tool, pretty uh, convenient, and uh, Quarkus directly generates a needed template for it. I could also use CDK or Terraform or serverless framework or another um, method of my choice. So there are a lot of things. I'm just changing some of the default values here. I want to use Java 21, which is the latest LTS release. I provide a bit more memory, and then I can... If I find my deploy here, this looks good. I can just run the deploy. I just leave all the values here. No authentication. You shouldn't do that in production, of course. So, and the Wi-Fi works perfectly in this room. That's the first thing where I was afraid of. And um, now after some time, it now creates a serverless function and an API gateway with a default role in front of it. And I should be able to test it quite soon. It's always slower when you are waiting for it. So what, what happens in the back, there we see the API gateway gets created. So I, I will get an HTTP endpoint that points to my uh, deployed code um, in the function. There it is. So here we see the, the value. This is generated, of course, in the end when I head to production, I will use my own DNS names um, because I, I don't want the customer that they need to change the endpoint, but for now, for testing, I get this internal auto-generated uh, one in here. Uh, I just copy it, and then I'll do a 
curl, which I have somewhere here. And here you see the nice things. It's not just like um, calling an, an endpoint. Um, you always have to, to send this XML blurb um, to have a well-formed request. So nowadays with REST, this is much simpler. So, and here I see I have my, my request there, SOAP env envelope, get customer by name, my test customer name, and then I submit it. And you can count, and you see it actually it took a lot of time, right? So maybe five seconds, something like that. To find that out, I can also pull the logs from remote. This is also something um, the SAM CLI offers me, that I pull the logs from the, from the serverless service. So there it is. And I see uh, different values here. So overall, somewhere here, you see um, that Quarkus boots up. As I zoomed in, you can't see the Quarkus logo. But here's the CXF code and the whole Quarkus stuff got initialized. The interesting piece for us is in the end, you see an init duration of 2.8 seconds. So this is how long it took to initialize the whole code. Now let's just call it again. And you see it's, it's directly there, right? So um, some of you may imagine what, what happened. Any guesses? Yeah, in this time the service was already available and on the, on the first execution it happened that the whole initialization needed to, to take place, right? So um, let's get back to the slides to explain. So this is what we've seen, um, the life cycle. So here you, you see um, the life cycle of the function that, that we've deployed. So we've done this here. On the left-hand side, we did the compilation with Maven, we packaged it, we uploaded it, and deployed it. And once my first request came in to the function, uh, what the service does is it downloads the code, so it's actually saved in a, in a bucket somewhere. So it needs to be downloaded, um, the whole stuff with all the jars and classes. Um, then we need to obviously start the Java Virtual Machine. Um, because it's serverless, there's nothing there if there's no request. So up until the request arrives, everything happens. And then we need to load and initialize uh, all the classes and the handler is the, the entry point. So um, that's provided by Quarkus and redirects to the whole um, CXF chain. So that just takes some time. Uh, if you imagine you, you run an application locally, it, it also takes some time to boot up. And if you start a serverless container, it would also take some time. And afterwards, um, the invocation happens, so my uh, code is processed. So while it may be acceptable for some requests that I have this extended duration, if you have a customer-facing application that relies on the API, it's, it's definitely not to have a variance. Sometimes it's three seconds more, sometimes it's less. Um, so, and, and you correctly identified it. Uh, in the case where it was faster, it was a warm start, and what we were seeing with the three seconds, this was a cold start. So, um, and this can act actually, this is an important point to see. We could just think, yeah, okay, you initialize it once, uh, and then it's there, so no problem, it's just the first request. But if you, if you look at how it scales, if there are concurrent requests, um, so this is the first one, initialized execution. Uh, and then a second one comes in while the first environment is still busy with the request, we create another one because the scaling just happens differently compared to the classic request handling in an application server. So while an application server is um, multi-threading uh, and we can just uh, increase the thread pool and memory and then it will handle more requests and we may spin up a second node to um, balance it a bit, something like that, here it's just one request, one execution environment. And if this is busy, we initialize another one and we again need to spend three seconds on it. So, and afterwards, this was what we've seen. Um, if the execution environment is, is free again, uh, it will stay warm uh, for a certain amount of time until we shut it down again. So we can handle it within the existing environment. 
So yeah, we need to optimize it. Uh, and one way of optimizing it is using Lambda Snapstart. So what we do with Lambda Snapstart is the, the whole stuff runs in a sandbox, which is provided by, a fi uh, by the Firecracker micro VM uh, technology. Uh, this is also an open source project. You also find it on GitHub. Um, could be an own talk, so uh, no time today to dive deeper into it. But what we basically do is we snapshot the whole VM, not just the, the JVM, um, the whole VM with memory and state. Um, this is something, thank you. This is something that we just snapshot and put it to a low latency cache. Uh, and I will just do it so you see the difference. So what we see here is, I have a little cheat sheet. Uh, we can just enable it by adding the property to our file here. And then we do the deploy again. So this is something we leave all the same. So, and uh, what we will what we will notice now uh, takes a little longer because, just going back to the slides, what we do is once the deployment happens, we will run and initialize the function once uh, to take the snapshot. Right in the previous deployment, nothing happened. We just um, deployed it and we are done. And then up on the first request that came in from the um, external from my curl request the whole initialization happens. What now happens is we will uh, see the initialization happening in the deployment. Then we take this uh, version snapshot, put it in a cache. And once I call it, uh, we resume it. So we, we just take the snapshot and uh, re-execute it from there. So And this is faster. Um, there are some trade-offs. So if I have, for example, networking connections to my database, the database will already have closed it and, and certain things like that. That's why there is an API available uh, with two methods that you can implement to probably close things or reestablish it. Uniqueness is also a problem. Um, this is something that you can use the API for. And the frameworks like Spring, Quarkus, um, they, they already offer some support because the correct project is very famous in the um, JVM community nowadays. So um, while this is still creating, so yeah, we check that out once this is finished. Uh, this is one optimization. Um, it's fully managed, and as you saw, it's just a checkbox, right? I say I, I want it, I enable it, and then it is uh, it is there. The second option um, is, this was the demo with Snapstart. Uh, the second option is, what, what we've done now is we moved some stuff to the earlier stage, like uh, within deployment, we already take the uh, snapshot and restore it from there. We can even move more stuff um, to the build and deploy phase, um, because this is like, we can use some time more or afford it in our CICD pipeline and then minimize the execution time at runtime, right? That sounds like a good idea. And this is what GraviM does. So GraviM is, is also a project that has been around for some time and this really offers a very low memory footprint because during the build time, all the references, everything gets resolved and in the end you are no longer running on a JVM but rather on a yeah, binary image that gets uh, produced as part of your build process. And this is, um, this is super nice because uh, you, you really can reduce the memory consumption dramatically. And the smaller the things are that you are initializing, there is no class scanning or something like that, dependency injection. All the things uh, are no longer happening at runtime. So we can even more reduce the time there. So um, first, now that this is deployed, let's, um, let's check out how much we gained using Snapstart. Good. So 
So do the same API. So and you see it, it was faster. So after the deployment, everything got obviously reset, so there there were no things in there. So and now you see we are we are down um, significantly with uh, uh, durations because we have just the restore in here and uh, we are below one uh, one second, so from three to one second. It's already uh, quite an advancement and uh, what we now want to do is we want to use the Gravium part in comparison and for that I first need to rebuild it with a different parameter. So as said, we will have more work to do during the build cycle. And that's why also the compilation, if you remember, and the whole build process for the JVM part earlier, it took around eight seconds. And now you see there's a lot more stuff going on here with the Gravium build because it needs to resolve all the things. Um, there's a um, fully fledged build process happening with with different magic things that are happening here. So uh, a lot of uh, things going on while building that already. And this is also the disadvantage. If, if you use certain frameworks that are not supported and the metadata is not available, uh, you, you use certain language features like reflection um, that may um, yeah, provide difficulties using um, Gravium. Good. Okay, well, while this is moving on, um, and I see time is running up, so uh, I'll just show you the results here. Um, so build time, it takes 90 seconds to build. And execution time overall, um, the init duration is just half a second. This is what, what you saw there. So we can even reduce it more drastically. But the key fact... Uh, and this is what you see here in the middle, small is the memory size. So while I had configured the classic JVM with one gig, here I can achieve the same uh, results with just 128 max. Um, so this is, this is quite cool. Um, and this brings me to the summary. So um, what you should see is that CXF exists for 16 years, we are still um, maintaining it. I'm no longer that active than I was in the, the past, to be honest, and uh, same is for some of the other committers. So we didn't add new committers to the project during the last year. So if you are interested in contributing, feel free to just join and, and get active. Um, for me, it's, it's nice to see that even old applications that, that are more than 10 years old, you, you can still run them. So if, if customers have built something in the beginning of CXF um, and they did some, some of the updates, it's still working. So it's a very mature project that you can rely on. Um, second takeaway is uh, the API infrastructure, if you run it serverless, you've seen it's very lightweight, easy to create, um, no need to deal with VMs or operating system stuff. So it really allows you to lower the costs and you can just automate the infrastructure management tasks and easily get the, um, the API created there. And also the elasticity in, in cost. If you have an API that's not called that frequently, uh, it will be very cost efficient to run it that way. If cold start times are a problem for you, um, then don't... Uh, listen to the TypeScript guys or the Python guys saying, yeah, yeah, you need to move to my script language. I recently had a customer who, who tried it because all the new software devs who, who came in just from university said, yeah, I can't use Java, so let's implement XML in, in TypeScript or Python. And it didn't work, right? So it was just partially implemented there and there were a lot of um, problems. So just stick to Java, it's the, the language that many developers know, and use uh, one of the optimizations here to um, improve the performance. Good. Um, we have two minutes for questions, if I'm not... Exactly. Any questions? <laughs>